thank you very much for that warm welcome. What an honor. And I'm ready because I looked at the uh, YouTube video that said, I'm to pronounce your name, Pray Jean. Is that right? Pray Jean. You're cracking, Mary. Oh, okay. cracking. All right. So that's how we're going to start. But may I call you Sister Helen? That would be fine. May I call you Mary? Yes, you may. Okay. Like many of you, I became familiar with Sister Helen's story, Dead Man Walking, because of the movie by the same title. I was and still am a huge fan of Susan Sarandon. Me too. Yes, who won an Oscar for a portrayal of Sister Helen, and the ultimate bad boy, Sean Penn's portrayal of a condemned man facing the death penalty was riveting. But their portrayals, as compelling as they were, can't compare to Sister Helen's revolutionary and compassionate argument against capital punishment. Originally published in 1993, Dead Man Walking is still the definitive text on America's death penalty. So much so that when I was preparing for this event and I went through the P Chicago Public Library to try to find a copy of your book, they were all out and in circulation. That was six weeks of waiting. I finally bought the book. <laughs> so now here, before we begin our conversation, here are some facts. Three states' governors have placed moratoriums on the use of the death penalty. Oregon, 2011, Pennsylvania, 2015, and California, 2019. The death penalty is legal in 29 states and illegal in 21 states and DC. According to the Death Penalty Information Center, 25 people were executed in the United States in 2018. The number of sentences imposed was 42. According to the Criminal Justice Project, there were 2,673 people on death row in the United States as of April 1, 2019. Illinois ended capital punishment in 2011. So there are some things yes. you need to think about. Yes. So now, Sister Helen, you begin your book, Dead Man Walking, not talking about crime and punishment, but about poverty and race. Would you explain why? Well, as I bring out in River of Fire about my spiritual awakening, it took me a while to understand that the deep Christian call was not simply to be charitable to people around me, but to be engaged in justice, as Pope Francis is inviting Christians that we who practice the way of Jesus ought to be the field hospital out with the wounded and, and the people on the margin. So you have to understand I grew up in privilege. You know, I grew up and then in kind of a double cocoon of the privilege of having a successful lawyer, father, African-American people as our servants when I was growing up, and then joined the sisterhood, which before Vatican II, it was almost cloistered, like you didn't eat with the other teachers in the school. Uh, you had your own nun's bathroom. Of course, the seventh and eighth graders always wanted to know, do nuns go to the bathroom? Do nuns have hair? You know all their questions, you know. They're little questions, you know. And uh, so the, a big part of the waking up was that I realized that in my city in New Orleans, there are 10 major housing projects where 50% of the city lived in poverty and I'd never been to any of them. So when I woke up that the gospel of Jesus was about justice and not just simply being charitable to people around me, I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects and that's in River of Fire, that's, that's as gradually when I woke up where it comes into the journey. And African American people had to be my teachers because I didn't, I never heard the term white privilege. I didn't know it was privilege. <laughs> I thought everybody, look, all you got to do, look, educate your kids, get your kids in education. Everybody can pull out of poverty. I didn't know. 
And they were so patient. One more little white lady coming in there. They're going to sit me down. They're going to help me get through. And wonderful civil rights leaders that taught me about how you have to struggle for justice and, and good lawyers and human rights people that began to educate me. And that's what happened in St. Thomas. And it's while I was there, coming out of the Adult Learning Center one day, on St. Andrew Street, right there, in, and I met somebody from the Louisiana Coalition on Jails and Prisons. He said, hey, Sister Helen, you want to be a pen pal with somebody on death row? And I said, sure, I could do that. I, I knew I could write letters. We hadn't executed anyone in Louisiana in 20 years. There'd been an unofficial moratorium that began in the 60s and through the 70s. And I thought I could write a letter. And I didn't know that two and a half years later, he's going to be electrocuted to death, and I'm going to be there, and I'm going to witness it, and it's going to change my life. Okay. So when did you know, I'm a writer, write a column, take notes, take uh, conversations. I was fascinated by the fact that you were able to write about this experience. I mean, quotes, uh, yeah. moments, <clears throat> emotional moments, uh, your feelings about uh, meeting him and your feelings about going through that journey with him toward death. Yeah. Uh, how were you able to do all that? I mean, did you have journals? What, what yeah. did you do? Well, I've been keeping a journal uh, since 1963. I was inspired. There was an exhibit of John F. Kennedy's, um, and I tell about it in River, uh, and I saw it, and it had like his little postcards from camp and some things he had written as a young person. And I thought, wow, you know, it's so valuable to write stuff down. So I began a journal. It's not like a diary. I had lunch with so-and-so. We went to the movies. It's a soul journal. You put things in it that count, that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's when you're trying to sort things out and all. So all that, when I wrote that man on death row, I put it in my journal writing to Patrick Saunier on death row. And so then when I'd go visit, I'd just put down what struck me. Mm -hmm. And then through even the last hours, the conversation, some things just imprint themselves on your mind forever. And you remember those snippets of the last conversation or where he's saying to me, look, sister, you can't be there at the end and watch this because it's really going to be bad and I don't want it to scar you. Showing me love at the end. Anybody, when you die and you want somebody with you who loves you, and he's trying to spare me, you know, and, and I'm saying to him, Pat, I have no idea what it's going to do to me, but it's not about me. You're not going to die alone. You look at my face. I'll be the face of love in Christ for you. You have a dignity, Pat, that they shouldn't be killing you. Look at me. And I kind of put all that down afterwards when I came home just to record it, because it was so precious. So in the beginning, when you were working, at the, um, working in the housing project, when that was your ministry, had you given any thought at all to the death penalty? Some. If the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church, which I learned as a child in the Catholic Catechism, which was only changed on August 2nd, 2018, took 1,600 years of dialogue, some things go slowly. Uh, so what we taught, were taught was the fifth commandment, uh, you know, thou shalt not kill. But exception made for war, or the state had the right to kill violent criminals to protect society. It was always about defense. And I'd grown up with that. In fact, you know where I went to high school, Mayor? At St. Joseph Academy on Broussard Street, Baton Rouge. Right down the street was the jail. And we had a portable electric chair that they would bring to places where they had been with the crime of rape and murder, where only black men for the rape of, or supposed rape of white women were actually electrocuted right down the street from me in this portable electric chair. But I was not awake. And when you're not awake, you're not awake. And later, when I look back and I started looking at the history of this thing, saying, I said, wow, that was just right down the street from me. So I started with the traditional understanding of the state has a right to take life to protect society. And that's been the crunch of the dialogue, of the Catholic dialogue. 
Mm -hmm. Because at the heart of it, and uh, you know, you keep doing the dialogue, and I was in churches, I was all over the place, but in churches with the people mainly. And every now and then you bump into a pope. <laughs> I, would pump, I would bump into bishops, but for the most part, the bishops were having none of it. They wouldn't touch it, it was too controversial or whatever. But every now and then, and I got to yeah, have a direct dialogue with, with me and Pope John Paul II. And so the question I asked him in the letter, which people in the Vatican said we handed it right to him. He was waiting for that letter. He knew that letter was coming. And I said, Your Holiness, I keep meeting Catholics who say they're for life, they're pro-life. But what they mean by that is they're for innocent life. But if people, that they're for the death penalty because people who cross the line are guilty, they're not pro-life for them. And, and they make a distinction. And I said, Your Holiness, it, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of innocent life? When I'm walking with a man to execution, and he's shackled hand and foot, and he's surrounded by six guards, and they're gonna walk him right down that aisle right there through those doors and kill him. And he kind of turns to me and he says, Sister Helen, please pray God holds up my legs when I make this walk. Does the Catholic Church not uphold the dignity, not only of innocent life, but guilty life, because he's going to be rendered completely defenseless and strapped down and killed. The killing, intentional killing of people made defenseless. Does the church really support that? And I knew the teaching was always, it was to defend society. But I said, we have prisons and society can be protected. That was a crunch. And I think it was a pivotal, I'm not the only one in dialogue around, I mean, the bubbles were rising up in the pot. Human rights was gaining ascendancy in the world. Country after country is putting down the death penalty around those essential human rights, Article Three of which in the UN Declaration is the right to life, which is inalienable. So governments don't give human rights for good behavior, and they don't take human rights away for bad behavior. They cannot be the arbiters of life or death. So anyway, but the crunch for the Catholic Church was, is this really defending society when we have another way? Mm -hmm. And uh, he got it. And he was one of the first to stand up and then begin to veer the discussion more toward and away from the death penalty. And then Pope Francis uh, finished it off. But it took a while. But dialogue is always the way we change anything. We're not just talking about Catholic Church or a Christian body. We're talking about our democracy. We're talking about the rights of gay people. We're talking about rights of immigrants. We're talking about why we have 40 million poor people in this country. We deal about so many things, and it's about dialogue. And the best thing about art, mm -hmm. this opera, this book, your work as a journalist, is to take people deeper into the conversation and you gather in a room and you talk together and dig deeper into things. And that's the way we change things. So talk to us about the um, struggle that you had in terms of the victim's family. Because you know, some say there, were, there might be innocent people on death row, but you know, you've, you've been there, you know that some of them will readily admit they did it. Oh yeah, most people on death row are guilty. So how did you manage and how did you deal with the fact that you are advocating on behalf of someone who's guilty and there are victims and family members of those victims who really wanna see or feel that justice is not done unless that person pays the ultimate price, which is death. That has been the political rhetoric about the death penalty, that only a death. And, and I've been present at death penalty trials. You know, you have two trials. One is to see if the person's guilty. If you find them guilty or not, then if they've been found guilty, you move to the sentencing part of the trial, a whole other trial. Mm -hmm. And that, those 12 people are going to go in that room to come out with a unanimous decision. Will this person live 
or will this person die? Which is an awful lot to put on the shoulders of ordinary citizens. And, and you listen to the closing arguments of those prosecutors, and it always revolves around, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, don't feel sorry for him, that we have to respect his human rights. He didn't respect the human rights of his victims. And see that family sitting there? They are never going to see their daughter graduate from college. They are never going to have the joy of their grandchildren. He killed their child. Do justice for that family and give him the justice he deserves. And what is justice for that family? It can only be one thing. He killed, he dies, and we will allow them when the execution happens, 15 years from then, 20 years from then, that they will get, we'll give them a front row seat and they will get to watch as we kill the one who killed their loved one and by watching that, they will be healed, they will have closure, they will get justice. That was the argument. And when the death penalty first got started and you could hear the arguments and we were all made to be afraid that there were some people by their nature and their character and by what they had done were so evil and unredeemable, the only thing we could do would be to terminate their life. And people were made to be afraid. And we can't put them in prison. They're killers. They're going to kill other inmates. They're going to kill guards. What we have to do for the safety of our society is that we have to terminate them. And they'd use things like a mad dog. You got to put that dog down. Mm -hmm. They're animals. They're scum. They're not human. The, the demonizing of people who've done a crime and identifying them with an action. And you know, I found this out because, of course, I was learning everything mm -hmm. that at trial, as much as a prosecutor might want to point to somebody and call them an evil person, they can never do that. You can call the action evil, but you can never assign that persons in their character are evil. So what their ace in the hole or their winning argument, their deeply moral argument is we're doing it for the victim's family. So 30 years down the road of this, and the best example of this was in New Jersey, 14, 12 years ago, when it came before the legislature to repeal it. And 62 murder victims' families testified before them, don't kill for us. The death penalty re-victimizes us. It puts us in a public holding pattern in our grief. We can't retreat to a place to grieve. The media is at our door every time there's a change in the status of the case. Don't kill for us. But it took a long time to learn that. In this book, in Dead Man Walking, and you see it in the opera, when you have Owen Hart, the father, I'm standing between them. They're going, you don't know what it's like. The victim's families are singing. The mother of Joseph de Roche is singing, you don't know what it's like to see your child slip through your hands. And I'm going from one to the other, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Owen Hart says, you say that a lot, sister, I'm sorry. And maybe it comes from you being way out of line. And the big mistake I made that's in the book, I didn't know what to do with the victim's family when I took that first man on death row, Patrick Sonier, and he and his brother had killed two teenage kids. And I, and I could tell they, the father, especially of the girl, was on the news all the time, so angry, saying, I wish I could pull the switch myself and can't wait to see that SOB die. And, and I went, well, I don't think, I mean, I can't, go see, I stayed away because I just went, I'm the spiritual advisor of the people who have done this, Pat and his brother. They not going to want to talk to me. And I had a great editor at Random House. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't had Jason Epstein, first time author, never written a book, who helped me shape this story, you never would have had a book, you never would have had an opera, you never would have had a film, you never would have heard of this book. That had been done non, dead and unwriting. I mean, that had been the end of it. <laughs> so Jason as an editor, mm -hmm. and he looked at the first draft, and he said, you wait far too long. 
He's so about the human rights of this man about to be executed. He wait too long to talk about the crime. People gonna be reading this book saying, can she face what he did? Right. And the horror of killing these two teenage kids in cold blood? And he said, if you don't talk about that in the first 10 pages of this book, nobody's gonna read your book. And then in the part where I came to the victim's family, and I said, well, right. I didn't know what to do with the victim's family. I so mean, how did you, how did you get the, the, the nerve to even talk to the victim's family? I didn't have the nerve. And Jason said to me, you're letting yourself off easy saying you'd never done this before. He said it was cowardice, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I went, uh, well, well yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to face things when you write a book and be truthful. And he said, look, when you write your book, tell people about your mistakes as well. And, and you I did. That was, it, came, it came across very clearly that you understood the mistakes that you made going into it. Well, they helped me. One of the victim's families in particular helped me because I met him at the pardon board here. And he said, sister, all this time he'd been visiting with those two brothers and you didn't want to come see us. You can't believe the pressure we under. Sister, you've been visiting with those brothers. We needed you. Where have you been? And I just said, I'm so sorry. His name is Mr. LeBlanc. And then he was the one who said, look, I'm going to pray in this chapel. Come pray with me. Mm -hmm. And he, he's the hero of this book. Owen Hart is so important because he expresses that outrage and that anger. A father wants to protect his child. He would throw his own body over his child to take the bullet or to protect them from the stab wounds. And so he's so important in the journey. Everybody's on a journey in the opera. Okay. Did you ever believe the death row inmate, and that's Elmore Patrick Sonia? was innocent of the crime, or did his innocence or guilt matter? Hmm. What, you thought about this? These are good questions. You've been thinking about of this? Of course. <laughs> that story is actually complex, because two brothers were involved, and the other brother that got life actually killed two kids that night. But Pat was part of it. Mm -hmm. They were kidnapping kids and doing this thing, and one night Eddie blew. And Pat was supposed to be the brother who kept him calm. But, so he always felt guilty. He was, in fact, because he was part of that context. He was part of that fabric. And he was the one who would say, every night when the lights are dimmed, because they always keep lights on on death row because they're always watching the prisoners, they dim the lights like at midnight, and he'd kneel by his bunk and he would pray for the kids, their families, because it was, as, as people, I mean, I've met so many people that have been, been involved in murder saying it was never supposed to happen. Things got out of control, and anyway. So it was mixed for Pat Sonia, but most of the people I've been with, well, half of them have been guilty, and they knew they were guilty, and we dealt with that. But I'm with the seventh person, Mary, on death row right now. Okay. His name is Manuel Ortiz. Three of the seven have been innocent. They were wrongly, put. that's how broken this blessed thing is. They're poor people, they didn't get good defense, truth didn't come out at trial, and they've been put on death row. So, but actually, the dignity of the human person, guilty or innocent, they do not deserve to be tortured and to be killed by the state. I'm strong on that. And that dignity, to be there for them at the end and say, look at me, look at me, I'll be the face of love for you. That, that's absolutely true, and that just gets leached out of you. It just comes. It's what you do when you're up against where they're intentionally going to strap a person down and kill them. So part of your, your ministry has been activism. Your activism is clear. It's out there. We understand it. But also, that there is a ministry in terms of ministering to the soul of that person, to that in a moment when they're in the most need. How, how did you, it must take a lot out of you to, to walk through seven. Well, this seventh one's still alive and we got him good lawyers and he's got a decent federal judge and he ain't gonna die. Okay. Go over my dead body, he's not gonna die. But six, yeah. Yeah, six. How, how, uh, how do you refresh yourself? How do you come back from that? First of all, 
most, of, I guess most people conceive it as, here's the angel of death row, good nun, going pouring herself out on those poor wretches. She must empty herself to them. I, when I visit with Manuel, I come away enlivened. My courage, I mean, he is going through, he's in his 27th year, and holding up against all this stuff. And you come away and you breathe the air of freedom outside of bars, you get in your car, you have agency to drive to go where you want to go. And it puts me in touch with just the life quick. Uh, it's hard to say it, but I've never been so alive because you're up against, it's life and death and what do you stand for? You know, what are you gonna be for? And of course, I take care of myself. I belong to a community. I develop deep friendships with people whom I love. Uh, I know how to play cards, drink beer, cook good food, <laughs> play cards with people. We got a great game called Beat Your Ass. It's a Louisiana thing. <laughs> And you gotta, you gotta be human. You gotta do the human stuff. I look at good movies, and there's a real, real good opera I've gone been to about 20 times, and I'm gonna be at it Saturday night. I mean, okay. it's a real good opera. That kind of enhances me, too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, are you disappointed that so many states still have the death penalty? I mean, your book kind of lays it all out. There's no getting around the arguments that you make in your book. But there's still, what, 29 states? What, does that disappoint you? Well, it's, I know the suffering, they're gonna kill a man in Georgia on November 3rd. They're gonna strap him down and they're gonna kill him. And life's gonna go on all around and the man, the human life. And the next moral argument we're gonna have to make is that the death penalty by its nature by condemning conscious, imaginative people and giving them a date of death is the practice of torture, which has a definition. Okay. And the definition of torture is an extreme mental or physical assault rendered against someone who's been rendered defenseless. So the people I've accompanied, the nightmare of everyone is, they're coming for me, it's my time, the guards are dragging me out of my cell, I'm going, no, no, I'm kicking in. And then I wake up, and I look around, I'm in my cell. It's not my night, it's not my time, but they're coming for me. Or to watch others be led past your cell to their deaths that maybe you played checkers with, or you, and to watch the death happening around you. It is that practice of torture. So when I look and see how many years later now, but I'm gonna tell you the hope, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just a deep truth that I know and I know that as long as God gives me the health and the strength and life, I know my job. And it's because I've been a witness, and it's to get out there and tell the story. So when I heard from my literary agent that they were going to do an opera of Dead Man Walking, because opera is the fullness of art. It's live drama, and it's music. And I knew if that was put together in the right way to bring people close. So when I came out of that execution chamber that night, and this is the deep hope in me, mm -hmm. in the dark, they bring in a prison vehicle, I am shattered by what I've witnessed, I throw up right away, and, it's, and, and I remember thinking, Mary, the American people are good people. They've been made to be afraid. They're not ever gonna get anywhere close to this as a secret ritual. I've been there. I got to tell the story. And I believed that the American people, when they're brought close to a reality and can reflect on it, will defeat and end the death penalty. Amnesty International taught me the first thing you look at when you see how things are changing in a society is to watch the practice. So 29 still have it on the books, but look at the practice. And we now know, looking at all the counties and all the prosecutors, 2% of prosecutors in their counties are responsible for 50% of the death penalty. We have never been able to apply it. We have taken the criteria of worst of the worst 
And over these 30 years of the over 1,000 people we have shot and gassed and electrocuted and lethally injected, 80% of them have been killed for crimes against white people. Mm -hmm. And when people of color have been killed, it is very seldom that the death penalty is. So all our biases, all of our frailties and problems, because we leave discretion up to prosecutors. And when they're out for political gain, especially in microcultures where the penal system, like the Deep South, which has done 75% of all, the real practitioners of death have been in the Deep South states. The Northeast had it, but they never did it. New York never did it. California has 747 people on death row. They've executed 13 people over 30 years. They, they're not serious about the practice. And we see the practice diminishing. And Amnesty International says, look first at the practice. And so we can see Texas. Mm -hmm. They used to get 48 death sentences a year. That state alone. Last two years, zero. Prosecutors aren't seeking it. Juries aren't handing it down because we're too aware now of all the mistakes. 167 people where we made a mistake. We didn't think we were going to be making mistakes. And a number of things that's causing the people in their reflection. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what I learned. I go out and I tell the story because I'm a servant of the story. I'm the witness. So <clears throat> what's the closest the people can actually come? So you have a great film that comes out and Dead Man Walking changed the way right. death penalty films. And then when, when you have an opera, you just have live drama, and you have this music to guide and instruct your heart. So you can't come out of that unscathed. It's the closest the people are going to come to one of the deep moral issues of our day. And it's even deeper than the death penalty or not. It's this universal thing of, where we all experience that someone hurts someone we love, or even hurts them badly, or hurts us. And it's that struggle. It's the Owen Hart struggle, but it's the struggle in all of us. That teacher, that person hurt my child. How am I going to respond? And am I going to respond out of hit, meet, and hate for hate and wrong for wrong? Or will I find a way out of it or through it? where I'm not going to let that love in me be overcome by the hate. And we all know that struggle. OK. Um, how, did the ministry, how did your ministry to death row inmates change you? How has it changed you? First of all, I stopped going to meetings at church that didn't amount to much. <laughs> <clears throat> no, n nuns go to a lot of meetings. I just started saying I'm only going to essential meetings about stuff. And I, was, you know, I had great coaches and teachers when I went to Hope House about human rights, lawyers. I learned about good lawyers who get in there with the people. Like, for example, in the St. Thomas Housing Projects, Miss Eva, she was in her apartment. But because she's a public housing welfare recipient, she had her bathroom leaking for six years. And she was in a wheelchair. And she'd get out and her feet were on that wet floor and she'd call maintenance to come fix a leak. They weren't fixing a leak. And everybody was saying that. We can't ever get maintenance. We can't ever. And they had rats at the time, and they didn't have lights. And here comes Bill Quigley, this little young lawyer. And he meets with the tenant association, because you become a community, you organize. And first, you learn your rights. You learn that as tenants, you have rights. You learn your rights, and then you begin to take proactive steps to confront the injustice. The very first public march of protest I was ever in was with the tenants in the St. Thomas Housing Projects to march up to the housing authorities and say, we need maintenance and we need attention and don't look down on us simply because we're public residents in, in that we're poor. And that was the first thing I ever did. And I began then to learn about the law and how important it is to know about the law, and then took it from there. Okay, thank you. I mean, there's lots of questions I could ask. Uh, we have a performance coming up. I do want to uh, slip in here some of the questions that was asked by the audience, the Q&A. And one of the uh, questions was from Elizabeth Luby. 
What first encouragement, inspiration did you receive to enter into your ministry to the incarcerated? Well, first it was from the lawyers getting in there with people. It was from human rights people getting in there with people. And then my own sisters. It is great to belong to a sisterhood. We cannot long do social justice alone. The Lone Rangers may make a little flash on the hilltop for a while, and then you disappear. You can't do it without community. And our sisterhood has been, and in fact, all this story of growing up, the motto about me in the community, I'd have these, all these wild ideas, how are we going to convert the young people of the world to Christ? And they say, there goes Helen again. And with one of her ideas, feet firmly planted in midair. And, and, that was, that, and it was true about me. I had all this, but I wasn't grounded. And when I moved into St. Thomas, I got really grounded because the people were so real. And they helped me learn. Okay. Uh, there, another question was from Barbara Joyce. How do you think American Catholics today should respond to the church's hierarchies continued refusal to grant equal status for women. The appendix to this book is a letter to Pope Francis that I got to meet twice. He got involved in an innocent man on death row in Oklahoma and I got to meet him about until the Catholic Church allows women to be an integral part of our decision making and policy making. We will never have a healthy church when you have all males in this little room and they making the policies and they making the decisions and you don't have the wisdom of the women, the practical lived experience of women, the deep spiritual life of women contributing to it, it's always going to be skewed. It's going to be not healthy. And it isn't good for them. I mean, we see they're making all kinds of mistakes. You leave all those little males. <laughs> And it's one, of those, it's one of those things like human rights in the world that's making its way because it's right and it's true. You know, Goethe said something a long time ago and when he said, when you are committed to a cause that is noble and true and right and unswerving in your commitment, providence moves for you and resources make their way to you. And I believe it's going to happen on the death penalty, maybe not tomorrow. I may not see every state repeal it, but I can see the practice going down right in front of my eyes. We haven't had an execution in Louisiana in 17 years. We used to be the most executing state. In eight weeks, we killed eight people in the mid-80s, executed eight people. Why? It's still on the books. And you know what my hunch is? I think that the ones closest to it, the wardens and the guards that got to do the actual killing, have had it. And they don't want to do it anymore. So they're just finding a way to just let it kind of quietly die. So this last question uh, on the Q&A, you, you touched on it a little bit, but uh, this one from Daniel Creed goes a little bit deeper. He says, recently read your book, River of Fire, My Spiritual Journey, and noted you use your journals to write your memoir. When I go back and reread my journals, I can't stay in them too long, for I find it brings back memories that are very powerful, sometimes quite sad. How were you able to review your journals and use them as your source material? And did you struggle did you experience powerful emotion when rereading them? Yeah, I realized, what am I going to do with all these journals when, when I'm going to die, man? Because they go back to 63. <laughs> uh, and, and, but I went to the journal because I knew I had to be the witness and tell this story. And that's why I use it. And, and in this, I wanted to bring people into interiority and just to share, it's a very intimate thing to bring people into our own interiority, how our consciousness changes about things. And so I use the journals in that to go to just see, oh my God, 
we went off half cocked most of the time. I mean, it was so unreal in so many ways. And I, I dedicated it to my community of sisters because they really helped me grow. And Vatican II and the Catholic Church helped us become an adult church with consciences and with intellects and to be able to get into the world, make decisions, and make things happen. And so you could see the growth in it. So this person sounds like they've had some hard, sad things in their life. So I wasn't reading it just to review my life. I was keeping it because I wanted to share it with other people. Okay. And so it had a purpose. Okay. And before we move on to our performance, I have one question that I have. Mary, you can ask me anything. Oh, okay. What did you think of Susan Sarandon's portrayal of you? <laughs> you gotta know. <laughs> Susan Sarandon is the one that made the movie happen. She was doing a client in Memphis, one of the Grisham stories, and a friend of hers uh, gave her the book Dead Man Walking when it came out in paperback. Look at this incredibly short timeline. Hard back out in 93, with 80% of the American public supporting the death penalty, by the way. Paperback came out in 94. Arlene Donovan puts it in Susan's hands while she's in Memphis making the movie. She spent the night reading it. And she called me up because she had to come do filming in New Orleans. And she said, I want to meet you. I've read your book. We need another kind of film that brings people deeper over to both sides of this issue. And I want to meet you because we need a film. We met at a little Cajun restaurant, which when I was on Oprah with Susan and Tim, and Oprah said, how'd you meet Susan Sarandon? I said, well, we met at this restaurant. It's called the Bon Ton Good Taste, that's French, and it's on 400 Magazine Street. Well, Wayne Pierce, who's the manager, Media people pouring in. I'm going, well, Wayne. He said, they heard about us on Oprah. You gave the address and everything. <laughs> Anyways, Susan and I met. We had crawfish a toupee. You always wow. get the food straight in New Orleans. Of course. And it took her nine months to persuade Tim Robbins to do that film. Did you read the nun's book? No, I did not read the nun's book. He was a project. And they walking down the streets of New York one night. And she grabbed him by the arm, and she said, Tim, did you read the book? And he went, I did not, and she burst into tears. And she said, if we're not gonna do a film of that book, we need to turn the book over to somebody who will. So probably for domestic tranquility, he read the book. <laughs> <laughs> An incredibly short time we had a film, and Tim Robbins said, it was the easiest screenplay he ever wrote, because I bring you over to both sides with the mistakes that I made. And he said, the nun clearly was in over our head. And that's part of the journey. And that comes out in the aria of Sister Helen, my journey, my journey to the truth, to myself, make me wise, make me strong, make me human, that song. And uh, so Susan, I love Susan. I called her not too long ago. When there was an innocent man in Oklahoma, I called her up, I said, Susan, I met a man, he's innocent, in all probability they're gonna kill him unless we do something, will you help me? And we got on CNN, and she came with me, and then we got people enlisted and helped save Richard Glossop's life. She's the real thing. So we call each other sister. Hey, sister. <laughs> She's wonderful, I love her. She's my sister. All right. Thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you.